Hey, everybody, this is Surrogate Stan. I'm here with Pete Johnson and Casey Johnson of Tatawai also. And we've got Kevin, Mark, and Daniel from Yvonne Reese in Chicagoland, um, a very historic tobacconist and one of Pete's oldest clients, going back to, I believe, 2004. Um, so, um, Kevin, I, I was going to ask you to uh, give a little little brief history of Yvonne Reese and um, the history with Tatawahe. And then I know you have questions for Pete. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, beforehand, we had some stories between, between you two about when the relationship did start and all that. So you guys can get into that. And then, um, Daniel, you can ask some questions. Anything else you, you know, want to hear from us update-wise? And um, Kevin, also, you know, what, what you guys have been doing during, during the uh, shutdown or whatever um and how how you're dealing okay <clears throat> well my name is kevin levy i'm generation five here at yvonne reese um company was started in 1857 four years before the civil war by my great grandfather's uncle um i don't even know if you can see if we turn the computer a yeah, little we bit just tilt it we tilt it but um, you go on the wall here this guy right here is the original owner he's my great grandfather's uncle and then as you go pan up, you'll see some, I don't know if we're doing it. Yeah, you, that's Yvonne Ries himself. And then if you pan a little further, there's a fifth picture of my grandfather. It's enough. <laughs> um, but, You're gonna run out of cord. <laughs> uh, we always joke that, uh, I always joke that you don't get your picture on your wall, on our wall until you're dead. So, wow. so well, my dad, I have my dad's frame picked out for him though. Um, but my dad's still around. He's been off for about seven weeks once the virus hit. So we've, he's been quarantining at home with mom and they're doing well. Um, but yeah, 163 years or so, uh, my family's been doing this and, you know. That's amazing. Even, even since you started in 2004, this industry has been a roller coaster. So well, I started in 2003. You guys became a client in 2004. So, uh, so you, were, you were late to the game. You were sorry. invoice 143. <laughs> always, always a day late and a dollar short. Something we haven't learned in 163 years. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's just been a roller coaster. I, it's been a roller coaster for the 20 some odd years I've been in the industry, and I can only imagine that it was that way for the 160 some, 150 some odd years before that. So you know, I'm I'm curious with that with that uh, timeline that you guys have. Have your has your dad told you about like stories that his father or his grandfather would have told him about? hard times before this like uh, thinking about no you know not really i mean i know that in the you know just in my history of growing up in it i know that things were good really good and when i was really young in the 70s <clears throat> uh, a lot of pipe smokers out there mostly pipe smokers i mean the cigar <clears throat> side of our business really didn't get crack and crack until the 80s but then i, I you know i kind of remember in the mid to late 80s you know kind of a downtrend you know there was a whole big health movement across the united states with don't eat red meat and jane fonda's workout videos and i <laughs> felt like i felt like i kind of remember that time if we wanted to go back and date that probably 83 to 86 or something where uh there was such a health conscious where i felt like you know i could remember things struggling uh but then, you know, the cigar boom happened and, you know, but this is supposed yeah, to be about I, I, you guys, not about us. So we should start. Well, no, yeah, but it's, it's good to hear the history because honestly, I mean, I think, you know, the boom came and then it ended, obviously, what was it, 97 and the end of 97. And then we went through a quiet period and then we had another resurgence again in the early 2000s. And of course, when the housing market crashed in 08, that slowed down a lot of stuff, uh, but then we just kept on, cru you know, trucking along. And now, of course, we're dealing with, with the, the FDA. And then in the middle of the FDA fight, we get hit by this pandemic, which is slowing everybody down. So, I would say, and then during the pandemic, I mean, we've just kind of been following whatever our governor's rules are. Um, you know. I know there's a lot of smaller stores out there that don't have a web presence. We've had a web presence for a number of years, so that's been really good and helpful. So we've got me and Mark and another guy here. 
who is just kind of processing web orders and pulling orders. Uh, this week, officially, we started doing curbside delivery. So, you know, my web guy, you know, got online. There's an option now to pick stuff up curbside. Um, but, you know, you're just doing just like everyone else out there. We're no different. Everyone is just doing what they can, you know. And uh, we're doing what we can. And when this is over, we can hopefully all go back to a little bit of normal normalcy, yeah. you know. Hey, you guys, you guys have a little bit of a historical lounge there. Is that correct? Is it still? Yeah, we still have a lounge. It's not open currently, obviously. But, uh, yeah, we put in a lounge in 2008. It started with just one little room uh, after Illinois did the smoking ban in bars, restaurants, and public spaces. And it's now grown to about, you know, it's probably – three times the size as it was when it started. So we've been adding on and trying to improve it as the years go by. Got is, is the rumor correct that there was a movie shot in that lounge? There was a uh, U.S. Marshal, the sequel to... Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting about that. If you ever watched that, they, they, they actually built a little set. They took our lounge and then they built their own little set in that lounge using a lot of the stuff we already had in there. But... The scene was supposed to be in New York. So then they created this whole big sign that they put on the front of our building that said, Yvonne Reese, New York. So <laughs> when you watch the movie, it looks like we have a location in New York. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so yeah, Wesley, yeah, they spent a whole day filming in here. And I think Wesley Snipes was in here for about 40 minutes. You know, they had wow. like a double come in and run through the scene a hundred million times. They, you know, they made a huge mess. I mean, it was crazy. And then Wesley Snipes showed up. He was here for like 40 minutes and then took off. So, but. Pretty iron cool. So that was interesting. So, so what do you guys have uh, for us that your customers might be interested in, you know, and hearing from the, the horse's mouth here? <laughs> Dan, you want to start with a question or two? Yeah, I wish you wouldn't call me a horse, Dan. <laughs> As it was coming out of my mouth, I was like, okay. <laughs> um, kind of playing like off uh, the history of Yvonne Reese um, and segueing with that, um, you know, the cigar industry is replete with companies that date back hundreds of years and generation after generation after generation of cigar makers. And Tatuaje isn't, you know, doesn't really fit that mold. Uh, like you said, it's oh, yeah. in 2003. Um, and not only that, but you were really kind of one of the first companies to to do that in, I guess, modern cigars. So was it, uh, what kind of challenges did you face, if any, being a new cigar company that wasn't, you know, one of these historical brands? I, I think early on, um, back in 2003, I had already been in the business for 10 years by that time. So this is uh, my 27th year uh, working in the cigar industry. And I'd already been in since uh, 93. I worked for a, a, a few um, stores in Los Angeles, one called Gus's Smoke Shop, which was one of the oldest stores. Actually, it was the oldest store in California, uh, 1927, not nearly as old as E1 Reese. Um, and then I moved on to a store called The Big Easy and then eventually got hired by the Grand Havana Room, which is a pretty historic cigar club, to uh, be their director of retail. Um, by that time, a lot of the industry knew who I was. So I got a lot of support from the people that kind of mentored me. They, they, they were very supportive. They were very intrigued that I was taking a chance on doing my own brand with a family that no one knew about. Of course, the Garcias um, started their company also in 2003, the same time I started mine. So I think the, the main question I got uh, from the people that have mentored me, like you're talking about Padrones and, and the Fuentes and, and guys like Lito Gomez and stuff like that, was, are they treating you okay? Are they making good cigars for you? Like, they're almost like the protective, like, older brothers or the because my older brother is not nearly protective as I'd like him to be. Uh, <laughs> um, they're like, you know, the, 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 like they were to me, they were like the, the godfathers of the industry. So they, I was like the apprentice that coming in and doing my own thing, but I got a lot of support from them. I think what 
the the obstacle that I had was the question from the consumer side of of uh, you don't own the factory. I'm like, no, I don't own the factory. Are you Cuban? No, I'm not Cuban. Are you Latino? No, I'm not even Latino. Like I'm a I'm a gringo with a little bit of Italian in from me from Maine. You know, <laughs> they're like, where is your company based out of? Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Why Los Angeles? So I got those types of questions. Uh, luckily, uh, I had, a, again, I had a lot of support uh, from the industry around me. And then I also had a lot of retailers that, that jumped on board very early that kind of uh, took a chance on the brand. And then the best part about it is I thought I, I really had good product. And the Garcias have, since that first day, um, you know, the, the cool thing about Tatawai, it was actually the first cigar that the Garcias actually made uh, for full production, even before they made their own cigars, uh, even before they made a Dom Papin cigar, they were making Tatuaje. So I think at the end of it, the proof was in the pudding and the cigars really showed uh, that uh, I didn't have to have generations behind me. The greatest, the best thing about working with the Garcia is I, I knew I had talent within a guy like Pipin Garcia, who, who has history. And, you know, he's been rolling cigars since he was uh, 11 years old, sweeping floors in his uncle's factory in Cuba at seven. So uh, he was the guy that was unknown, but uh, he's got a lot of background behind him. So sure. were most of the guys that took a, you said, took a chance on the brand. Mm -hmm. uh, were most of them older people in the business, like my father as an early mm -hmm. adapter? Or yeah, they... your, your dad. Uh, well, I mean, so like. You know, Vartan Safarian from Ambassador Cigars in Scottsdale, he's on the newer side, but there's some feel with Vartan that he just feels like he's been in business forever. I, I don't, Kevin, you probably know him pretty well, but uh, he's got one of those, that, that feel around him. Like when I would get phone calls from people that I knew really well in the industry, and I had, I had visited your shop in the 90s um, during like the big smokes in Chicago, I'd always go to Ewan Reese. Um, I'd always go see Diana. So if I got a phone call from, uh, some of the most historic stores in the country, I was like a little kid. I got, I got excited. Like one, I felt honored that they would even take the chance on me. So like when your dad called in an order, you know, or said, I'm going to bring in your product. That was a big deal for me. Um, same thing happened with uh, the, the Colonel, uh, uh, Rumbo when he was still around, he called me personally and said, uh, I want to bring in your product. I was like, wow, that's, that's <laughs> pretty amazing. I'm actually honored that you would actually take the time to call me. So I, I had a lot of support from a lot of the older guard. Uh, you know, for example, like the guys from W. Curtis Draper, that, you know, Matt and John who own Curtis Draper now, um, they've been around the industry for a while. Uh, they weren't obviously the original owners, but uh, they've, you know, that store's had a long history in this industry and, so stores like that, I, I really wanted to focus on, you know, the iconic stores that everybody knew about. And you guys were obviously one of them. Barclay Rex in New York at the time. Um, you know, all the older stores really, that was kind of like proving yourself that you, you could, you know, break that barrier. So it was kind of cool. I think then you should say that people weren't taking a chance on your brand. They were taking a chance on you. And yeah. That's, and that's a testament to who you are as a person. Yeah, I think you know, in this industry, guys like my dad and older guys, we weren't, the brands were always secondary because it's a relationship business. So we were taking a chance say. on you, not on your brand. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it was the relationships that, that really mattered. Right. Um, because, uh, you know, like Diana from uh, Updown, she came to see me at not until 2006. So they were actually a little late. But Diana, to me, was, you know, one of those ladies that you looked up to in the industry. And when she tipped her, her sunglasses down, and I looked behind me and I told Andy in my office, I said, give her whatever she wants. And at that time, it was like, okay, I'm not opening up certain accounts right now because I don't have the product for Brown Label Miami. But, uh, you know, when someone like that walks in your door, you, uh, you pay respect to the people that came before you. Hey, Pete. One of one of the uh, one of the things that um, I know about you is that you originally took a a pretty decent nosedive into tobacco history. 
going to old bookstores and all that. This is way back before the brand. And I, I'm just kind of relating to getting in, in front of um, especially historic stores like this when it first started with, you know, your love of the history of tobacco and the styles. And I know Tatawahe, you know, was a name that they couldn't even pronounce. That part of it was new, but the packaging and the style of the cigar and then going forward, some of the other brands that you came out with were all paying an homage to, you know, old Cuban brands. Yeah, I was, uh, I was the original cigar geek. That was me. I mean, I, I, I grew up, the, my first job was actually in a predominantly a pipe store. Gus's Smoke Shop in Los Angeles and Studio City was predominantly a pipe store and evolved into a cigar store also because of the boom. But they were a big pipe store. Gus's um, the one where all the, uh, the Hollywood actors and stuff would go to, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and we would actually get a lot of like a lot, a lot of the Hollywood uh, celebrities or, or very famous, uh, you know, musicians that, that when they would pass away, their, their widows would bring us their pipe collection to sell on consignment. Um, so I actually have pipes from like, you know, Henry Mancini and David Rose that were given to them by Bing Crosby. Wow. You know, the old merchant service pipes. Um, so I, I was just a nerd when it came to, to cigars, pipes, everything about the world of, you know, cigar stores or pipe stores. I, I researched everything. I, I own a huge collection of old books um, that, again, Dan mentioned that I would go into uh, like old antique stores or, or old bookstores and, and look, go find as many tobacco books as possible. And if I, if I didn't have them, I would buy them. Um, so I built up a pretty good collection of that. I was always researching the history of the industry and researching the history of the cigar. So I always had a plan on if I had my own brand, I needed it to be a certain way. And I don't, I don't particularly respect the, the wheel of cigars now uh, when you talk about Cuban cigars. Like when I was younger, I was a big Cuban cigar fan and I thought they were making amazing cigars. But I think they're making bad wheels right now. And that's the, the quote I always use. Like, they used to be great, but they're not as great as they used to be. And there are other brands and other companies and other countries making better cigars, in my opinion. I know, that, you know, I, I watched uh, the cigar doc that you were a producer on it, correct? Just came out. Yeah, yeah, the Hanrold. Yeah. Um, and I remember you, I mean, you made a similar comment in the, in the movie and I, I appreciated it because I think sometimes, um, I mean, Cuban cigars are great, um, but they're still cigars and they still have their ups and downs like every other cigar. And I think people are sometimes afraid to uh, approach them as the cigars that they are, as opposed to the, the myth that they are. Um, so I appreciated your comment in that, in that and hand rolled about it. Um, I mean, in, in here too, because there are great cigars from Nicaragua, great cigars from Dominican, Cuba, and the like, and they're all cigars. You know, they all have their ups and downs. So, I like that analogy. Actually, we do all we we do have a lot of ups and downs, even ourselves. You know, in some batches, as much as we try to make them the same way every time, sometimes we get unlucky uh, because once it's rolled into a cigar and it seems like the cigar is perfect. You, there's things you just don't see. And you would actually have to taste every single cigar coming off the bench to make sure that they're exactly the same, which is of course impossible because if I smoked them all, there would be none left to sell. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so Tatuaje has been kind of a leader in limited editions and, uh, and, and you know, that, um, kind of trend in the cigar industry with FDA and, and your own, you know, personal choice to end monster series. Um, where do you see that going forward? I, I guess, especially with FDA, do you see, uh, limited editions pulling back and going back to more of a time of, of general releases or. Yeah, I think, I think that the, a lot of people are going to be digging back into their portfolio because a lot of us, 
well, I think pretty much everybody is going to going to be submitting their substantial equivalence uh, reports to the FDA for every cigar that they've ever made in their portfolio. The thing with the Monster Series, I'm able to go back in time and redo, you know, redo the Monster Series again. It's been, you know, 13 years. So next year, the plan is to to relaunch Frank. And the good thing is I'll make sure that Frank is registered against one of my existing grandfathered brands as a substantial equivalent cigar. And then I can re-release the Frank. Uh, so the plan is to to go back into the portfolio and, and start re-releasing old products. Nice. I mean, that's not bad. There's been some, uh, you know, I love limited editions, but sometimes there's just a cigar that's so good and you just want it back. So yeah, that's kind of an exciting premise. Well, I mean, 13 years of not having a Frank and, you know, there's, there's people that obviously have cigars, but if they want to, if anybody wants to try to buy one, people are selling them for like a hundred to two hundred dollars a cigar, which I think is crazy. And I'm not trying to kill the secondary market, but I don't believe a cigar that I put out on the market for $13 should be a hundred or two hundred dollars now. So, I mean, this is a way for a lot of guys that didn't get a chance to try something to have that chance again. Well, when you re-release it, you'll be sure to ki kill that secondary market. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I always, I, I actually, I, I, I kind of hate to say that, but I, I, I kind of do that a lot of times where I get upset by the fact that people are, are charging so much for the product on a secondary market because these things are meant to be enjoyed. And I get questions a lot from, from consumers like, hey, I have an opportunity to buy, you know, a franc, but it's going to cost me a hundred bucks. I said, man, go buy, uh, go buy 10 other cigars. <laughs> I think you're, I think you're going to be happier. Right. I and mean, those, yeah, it's once in a lifetime, but at the same time, I'm going to try to find a way to come back out with it. So. But, so and when it is re-released, there's no way to compare that old Frank to the new Frank. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're too, you know, unless no, you you'd have, have to, yeah, you'd, you'd have, have to be a time memory. machine. Yeah. You'd have or, to go into a time machine. Or like the perfect sense exist. memory of what that was like fresh. Um, yeah. And the tobacco source between then and now, has changed so much. Now it's all Garcia tobacco. So yeah, that's sure. going to be uh, the idea, but behind the La Verite in a in a way, isn't it? The yeah, I can't go back and make more 2008 or 2009 or 2013 La Verite. Um, even I had 2010 in the queue. Uh, Dan, um, Casey, and a, a friend of ours. Um, actually smoked the 2010 La Verite and they all liked it, but there was something about it that I couldn't put my finger on and I just never made it. But fast forward, like a, a year later, Jaime asked me if I was going to do the project because the tobacco was still sitting there. I go, no, I'm not going to do it. So he ended up use, utilizing that tobacco for regular production stuff, but I can't go back and say, Hey, Jaime, you still have any of that 2010 tobacco so yeah. I can make that. It, yeah. It doesn't exist. That's what I, I do love about La Verite is that they're truly unique to where we can't, we can never replicate them and we, we can't go back and make more. So that's, sure. that's truly a limited addition to its, its simplest, you know, point. Uh, yeah. I've, I've, hold on. I was going to say right. I have a quick La Verite story for you. Um, before I started working at Yvonne Reese, I had, was was a, a regular there and I bought 2013. Um, I was still living with my parents in the suburbs of Chicago at that point. So I had take, like bought the cigar, brought it home. Um, and I had just started at that point dating my now girlfriend. We've been together, I don't know, probably two months, three months. So there was like summer night, wasn't doing anything, went out back porch, lit the cigar. I was maybe an inch into it. I was like, this is really, really good. She calls me and says, what are you doing? You want to come over? And I was like, <laughs> I just lit the cigar and it's, it's a really good cigar. <laughs> so my relationship almost ended right so there. You had, you, you had, the, uh, you had the, the mid afternoon booty call and you were trying to figure out whether or not it was worth leaving the cigar 
or to go get the booty call. I don't know if it was a booty call, but <laughs> even if it was, that cigar was really, really good. <laughs> and I'm guessing that the cigar would have lasted a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we're not all as old as you, Kevin. Some of us have a little bit more stamina. <laughs> so when it comes to new product releases, now you know that, well, at least the retailers I'm friendly with, we all have a love-hate relationship with new product releases yeah. in, in these current times. Um, when you produce a new product or go into the project of a new product, do you do it with the consumer in mind? Do you do it with the retailer in mind? Is it just your passion for cigars that drives you to make a new cigar? Or does it become all about dollars and cents? Like you have to uh, Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think it's a mixture of everything. I, I love creating. And there's always that that uh, that time where you you sit and look at your regular portfolio, which still sells really well, and is still the reason why the the company exists. But it, there's always that itch of writing a new song, and then eventually, you know, it ends up he helping the uh, the retailer, which is my our main focus is making sure our retailers have something that they can sell. And it ends up driving, I think a lot of those limited editions end up driving people back to the core line. And that's, and that's where the dollar, dollars and cents come in because it's really about supporting the brand that already exists. So th I think it, it, it encompasses everything. Uh, you know, and then of course you always think about the consumer. You're like, maybe, maybe consumers aren't smoking as much of our product right now because they're looking for something new. That type, of, that's always a question in your mind. Like maybe we need something new to spark the interest of the brand again. I mean, luckily we, we haven't had to, you know, think that way uh, so much uh, because the brand's still continuing to, to do well. And it's also been continuing to grow over the years, but uh, it's always that question is like, maybe, maybe we're missing something. Daniel, do you have another question? Yeah. Um, and one question I, I ask on kind of all our, uh, manufacturer conversations. Uh, what's your favorite Tatuaje cigar? What's your favorite non Tatuaje cigar? And, you know, Dan Casey, if you guys want to answer that too, please. Yeah, I, uh, I always go back and, and tell people that uh, if I had a choice to be on a desert island, well, not a choice, but if I was told I was going to go on to a desert island and I only had one choice of cigar, <clears throat> it would be the brown label made in Miami. Uh, the Havana Casadori size. It's a six and three eighths by 43. For me, it's one of the most classic uh, cigars in my line. Um, I just love that size. And that's, everybody thinks it would be the black label Corona Gorda because it was another special cigar that I did for myself originally, but I still go back to number one, which was the Havana Casadori. Uh, non Tatuaje brand. I'm going to be a uh, very simple and say it's a dump of peen. <laughs> I think I think for me I, I've been quoting oh, my des desert island cigar as a Tatuaje J21 um, that one still still holds some place in my heart and um, and then obviously surrogates um, when when we've got broadleaf <laughs> the skull breaker is you know my favorite my favorite thing on that side um, That's outside a of our brand <laughs> yeah so outside outside of our brands um, and you know, the Don Pepin products coming out of the factory, um, you know, Dion, Dion's products I love and, um, more current than that, everything that most everything that Nick Melillo has been doing is right, right in a finesse palette range for me as well. So Casey, um, for me, uh, the regular atelier, uh, lat 52, um, and, uh, I forgot this one the other day, uh, the ER, which is uh, something we did for, uh, it was IPCPR at the time, um, the ER-15, probably right in that wheelhouse for me. Um, and for other products, um, I bounce around a little bit. I go into stores smoking other people's stuff uh, to try, see what, every, what everybody else is doing. So... Uh, Dion, uh, Nick is a great example. I'll smoke some of, uh, um, of Aladino stuff too. Of, of, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
The yeah, Aladino is great. I think we're we all, all we're all, all on board with that. that. Yeah, we all appreciate what Aladino's doing. And you know, to get a little bit more specific from me, if I if I I would probably put everybody that they've named already in that same list. Like, I'll be really specific with like Dion. I don't like everything he makes, but I like his Apernay a lot. Um, with Nick Malilo, I like his Wawense Maduro. I think the Wise Man Maduro. I thought that was a, a great cigar. It actually reminded me of something that I would have done. Um, and then uh, the Aladino stuff, I really, I really appreciate what Julio Aroa does, no matter what. So it's it's nice to uh, see that Husto and Julio are putting out great product. Yeah, um, uh, I'm smoking one of the, the new TAAs. A little stronger than last year, huh? I think it's delicious. I think that it's, I think it's so balanced. I'm not, it's. Oh I no. Think, yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely got, I think it's, it's definitely got balance. It's definitely yeah. got balance, but it's actually on paper. It's a little stronger than last year. Really? That, I'm what, not sensing that. Any, any peppery that you might be getting off of it might be more coming from the Sumatra. Right. Yeah. I'm not, I think it's, I get more sweetness than I get. Pepper. Yeah. I the peppers in the back. Very nice. What, uh, when are these hitting the market? They're actually shipping right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I think I think uh, our sales rep, Mike Perales, should have reached out to you guys to see if you wanted <laughs> to have any of them shipped uh, during this time. But I, I know some retailers were like, yeah, don't ship anything right now because of... Uh, now, be, because of the TAA delay or yeah. cancellation, I don't even remember if we put a quantity in. Yeah, well, so, you, I assume you'll just hold to whatever we got last year or whatever. Yeah, whatever you you guys need, we have them. It's not like everybody's jumping on them right now because of uh, this whole thing. A lot of stores are closed. Right. Um, I mean, for example, if we go back to Barton at Ambassador. He's been closed since, uh, I think, mid-March. Okay. And, uh, you know, he always orders a lot. But uh, I think he's or opening up next week very for just curbside. Okay. Um, but uh, – yeah, a lot of retailers are like, hey, ship mine May 25th, you know, stuff like that. So we have them available. We just started shipping them last week, actually. So, okay. Anything else? Um, you know, you kind of touched on this question, Kevin, um, in regard to the limited editions. But one of the questions I like to ask uh, all the manufacturers we talk to is when it comes to your blending process, um, do you start with an idea? Is it a tobacco? Is it both? You know, how do you approach the beginnings of a new cigar? It's actually different. Uh, not every time, but a lot of times it might be a brand name that I have that uh, we're like, okay, we, we need to get that into the market sooner than later because I, I want to make sure I protect the trademark. Uh, that happens a lot. Um, but a lot of times we go into the, you know, when we go into new products or new projects, we always say, okay, what are we missing in our portfolio? Because we want to have a broad portfolio. We don't want to have all of them be strong. Sure. We want to have, you know, we want to have a seat for every ass and a price point for every wallet. So in the same year that I launched a $60 cigar, I also came out with a $4 cigar. And they're obviously completely different, but, uh, you know, I try to, I try to make sure we have a broad range instead of having a narrow, a narrow range. Absolutely. So it, it always, it, it really depends on what's going on. Like one time Pepin showed me a wrapper leaf that I fell in love with and that ended up becoming Atelier. It was a cover leaf that no one was using. The crop was basically grown for the Garcias to use and uh, Pepin and Jaime gave it to us. So we took advantage of it. That's awesome. So when you're uh, marketing a new cigar and coming up with names and images like that, obviously in the surrogate line with the skull breaker and things like that, you obviously were targeting a particular market, kind of uh, probably a younger online market. And as the people that gravitated towards you are getting older and more conservative, have you yeah. guys changed your approach to uh, naming and graphics and marketing? Well, I mean, Surrogates is, is a, a brand, and Dan can go into this a little bit more, but uh, 
it's one of those brands that's a complete anomaly in this industry. It's, it's literally limited edition every day of the week because every cigar is different. Every cigar is its own project. Every cigar tastes different. So it's it, like people always ask like, hey, uh, if I like the crystal baller in the surrogate line, will I like the skull breaker? I go, probably not because they're completely left and right. There's no, there's no similarities to them. So, you know, when you go into smoking a new line of cigars, you're like, Oh, I really like this Robusto. Maybe I'll like the Churchill also in surrogates. <laughs> it's a, it's a, an experiment every time you smoke one because you know, they're, they're all so drastically different to each other. Um, I think, for Tatuaje, it, we've tried to keep it simple. And that's, you know, and same thing with Tatuaje, um, even with the red label that we make in Nicaragua or even the Negotiant that we make in Nicaragua. Um, we try to keep those lines very classic and more geared probably towards the, the connoisseur and someone who is looking for, you know, a steady product that they can always find. Um, Again, with surrogates, it's it's uh, it's truly a limited edition. Just we make it in regular production. So, Dan, I don't know if you want to touch on that, but nothing, nothing other than we actually call it a project-based brand, and it kind of goes back to the conversation that you were having about limited editions. Um, the idea was basically prompted because um, I texted Pete and I was like, "Man, these these limited editions that everybody's doing just really drive me crazy because." You know, one, I don't think people smoke them. I think they collect them. And um, and then two, if I really like one, it's not available afterwards. So, and so Kevin, back to what you were saying about an older crowd, um, we get that a lot at events. Like if we bring in some special product that's available only for that event, there, there are some of the older cats that, that they don't want anything to do with that because yeah. if they love it, they want it available you know, all the time. And, um, you know, but, and so that's that part. And then back to what Pete was saying about, you know, some of our, our core line, if you look at brown label, red label, black label, and now Negociant, they're all, they're all similar. You know, they all have the, the, the simple Tatuaje band just in different colors, um, you know, and blend wise, they're, they're more in a classic appeal. Um, you know, Fausto is, is kind of an outlier because it's a really strong cigar that, um, you know, brand branding wise, you, you might argue it's a little more rock and roll than, than the classic, you know, side. Yeah. And then, it, uh, sorry, Dan, uh, it, think about Fausto. It, it's, it's one of these outliers as far as blend style and look because of the branding, but it's actually an old, a very old Cuban brand. I just decided when, when I, found that mark that I was going to create something on a, on a different scale that would go along with the name Fausto, because it's, you know, it's the whole story of Faust and the devil. So you, you really wanted to have something that had a little punch to it. And that was maybe a little angrier than most cigars. Um, and then so, Avion as well. Avion is the same blend, but in a box pressed, uh, per perfecto, um, different sizes. And, um, you know, so that's, it's, it's it really starts with tradition for me though. I mean, traditional, you know, I love the, the tradition of cigars and when it comes to uh, packaging, I'm more old school than new school. Of course we have like things like the monsters, which are fun, maybe appeal to a younger demographic, you know, that 20, 21 to 35 year old demographic. But uh, if you look at the regular core lines that what we do really focuses on tradition and, and history and, and making sure that we have a good core line for, you know, everybody to smoke. And it has an alternative name, though. That's the biggest problem with the Tatuaje. You know, like I was super serious with, with packaging, you know, going old school, super serious with sizes, very traditional sizes. Everything spoke tradition across the board on the original brown label until you heard the name. And you're like, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, but it, the name was all about uh, me as a, as a person because the, my nickname in the cigar industry was Tattoo Pete for years. So it just made sense to put that name on it. Sure. What else you got, Daniel? Um, and my last question, 
uh, is a personal question because I, I told myself I'd ask it. Um, and I always butcher the names, so you'll have to forgive me, but the uh, Bella Ancre Maduro, the Reserva. Is, yeah, Bellonc. You just say Bellonc. Bellonc. Don't, don't do okay, the. There we yeah. go. Um, when will I get more? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the Reserva with the Broadleaf, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that right now, Broadleaf has been in a shortage for, for many factories, not just us, but uh, uh, the Garcia's just just uh, got 79,000 pounds of Broadleaf uh, at the end of last year, which is in process right now. And uh, we'll start seeing that be workable towards the end of the year and then towards the beginning of the next year. So you might see them again eventually. It's, it's one of those cigars that I love. I've just been avoiding Broadleaf for a while because I know the shortages and I don't want to put a new cigar out with Broadleaf that I can't get all the time. Sure. Trust Daniel, me, I know trust we me we're on him because that's one of my favorites as well. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of cigars that are made in the surrogate lineup that, uh, that have Broadleaf on them and we haven't seen them for six months. Yeah. Well, when uh, I first had that cigar, I had uh, I'd gotten um, – one of the regular production ones in a trade. And I, I guy was well versed with Tatuaje, but I'd never had it. So I smoked the regular production. I was like, this is great. And then I found out that there was a Broadleaf and Broadleaf is far and away my favorite rapper. Um, and I didn't, at the time I like, didn't realize that it was a limited edition and so on and so forth. So I just walked into a cigar shop and they happened to have nine of them in there. And it, like thinking back, it, it was com comical because it was kind of past the release date and they just shouldn't have been sitting there, but there was nine of them. I was like, oh, this looks good. And I bought yeah. them. The, so that cigar originally came in, in a little travel humidor that Pete had made yeah. up and that's what they got packaged in. Casey, how, yeah. many, how many travel humidors did you find with a couple cigars in them? Yeah. <laughs> As we were traveling, we'd see them and Casey's like, I'm gonna buy those. Can I have the travel humidor too? <laughs> <laughs> No, and, and that's, if that's you look at of, that size, one of our favorites. If you look at that size, uh, the Belle Onc is actually an old Cuban size called Britannica. Hmm. And so when I wanted to come out, when I started looking at my 10 year anniversary back in 2013, I wanted to have a couple special sizes in, in the line to commemorate the 10 year anniversary, but they're regular production. And they, the, the only the difference is those are considered the 10 year anniversary cigars, but we didn't make them all back in 2013. We continue to make them, right? Sure. But uh, I was looking for something really cool, and I loved the Britannica size, but we didn't have molds for it. And Jaime and I were actually in Germany at our trade show there, and we ran into uh, some Italian um, mold makers that uh, make molds for Cuba, and they were able to secure us a bunch of molds in that size. So if you look at those molds, they're the color-coded um, – Classic injection molds that were made, you know, for Cuban production, but we got some. So, oh wow! So I'd like to wrap this up with two things. One is just a observation. Mm -hmm. uh, we should break the uh, mold of the cigar smoker, and one of us just should commit to shaving our facial hair this week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I nominate Daniel. You know, yeah, I nominate I Daniel. Too. I just said 10 years or 11 years straight, so it's not going to be me. I wow. think, again, you know, we're, we're perpetuating this stereotype here. So uh, I've, yeah. I've, been, I've been trimming, like, at least every, every week to keep it really short during this crisis because it, it had gotten down about that far again. And so, uh, uh, so my last question would be, either, probably should, we should probably start wrapping this up, is an industry-wide question. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously – you, we're on the front lines, but you guys are so many steps closer to the issues that we have. What do you guys foresee going on with the FDA? And does this whole coronavirus thing delay everything that's going on? And it's kind of a two-part question. And then as we've seen, as this thing has moved forward and uh, cigars, the amount of smokers coming to the market has changed, we see a lot of the big guys buying up. Well, I shouldn't say buying up. A lot of the small guys selling out to bigger guys. Um, yeah. A lot of people think that 10 years down the road, there's only going to be four cigars or four companies. So what do you guys foresee, you know, 10 years down the road, this industry looking like? I, I, you know, honestly, with, with the FDA, we've already seen a little bit of a push uh, for 
for a small reprieve, like with substantial equivalence, it, it got moved. It was supposed to be due um, next week. Our substantial equivalence reports were supposed to be in next week. And, and trust me, we have like 300 that we need to do. Um, and we've got a reprieve until September 9th now. So we've seen that get pushed because of the pandemic. As far as the other issues go, um, we're trying really to kind of uh, hope. I mean, we know that we're probably going to get regulated in some way, but we're trying to hope for more of a regulation light. Uh, and if we get that regulation light, which would be, which would mean, you know, submitting our substantial equivalence reports to the FDA, having all of our brands registered with the FDA, but avoid having the warning labels. Like we got a, we got kind of the warning label thing got pushed down the road a little while, but it's not rubber stamped a hundred percent that we're not going to have to put warning labels on. Hopefully, you know, if we end up having to put a warning label on, we can negotiate to a very simple, you know, standard size instead of this, you know, 30% crap that they want on every box, uh, which is just obnoxious. Um, and I, I think everybody's trying to go after like the similar sizing that uh, maybe like California already uses, which we have in our boxes already, or uh, what they, you know, the size that they put on cigarette packs. Um, I think if we can manage our way through this first stage of the FDA and, and really kind of uh, get something set in stone in 10 years, I think the business, the industry will be stronger. I mean, I'm hopeful. I mean, what about the uh, the face to face sale, the non internet sale, and then again on top of that, it seems like every time I see a headway where like they want to exempt premium cigars, uh, I never see anything about pipe tobacco, um, which is interesting because as you can see behind us, you know we're we're a pipe shop as much as we are a cigar shop, and our online business is a lot of pipe tobacco, and yeah. Uh, it always seems to me like they push the push and push for the premium cigars, but no one ever brings up pipe tobacco. So I don't know if you guys are fighting that fight or if there's other people fighting that fight. Well, the PCA, obviously, you know, they shifted gears a little bit with uh, changing their name to the Premium Cigar Association. And I know a lot of, of pipe uh, manufacturers kind of felt left out by that. Um, I don't really have a good answer for that. I mean, to be perfectly honest, it like, I think, I think all of us are going to be regulated in some way. I, I just hope that it's going to be on a smaller scale than, than what they're, or what they are originally looking at. And it's really about, uh, I think if we can prove the point with, uh, what we do with cigars, it might help us with the other stuff too. But I, I don't have a great answer for that. Yeah, I, I believe though, like I remember when they were talking, and Kevin, you can probably remember this too, when they were talking originally that every pipe would have to be registered. Yes. Well, that, to me, that's just similar. That's just silly. That doesn't even make sense to me because there's thousands and thousands of pipes. Um, how many different styles of pipes are there? Oh, right. And they're all different. You got a guy yeah. making handmade pipes. He can't have a substantially, I mean, I mean, I guess it's yeah. a clip and it's briar and I hand carved it. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's their, that's the substantial equivalence, and that's how simple that's how simple substantial equivalence should be, and I think that's what like with the cigar side, it's really simple with saying okay, we make a cigar no different than we make you know our original ones that are grandfathered, which doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so we're substantially equivalent to the same cigar that we've had out before two thousand seven. I think that's probably going to be very similar with pipes and pipe tobacco. The great thing about, you know, a lot of pipe tobacco and a lot of pipe makers, they were out way before 2007. So they're, they're technically grandfathered if I, if I think, right? Well, they are, except for the online ordinance, the face-to-face -face yeah. right. and no flavors. And that's always been a big thing about pipe tobacco is a lot of them don't have additive flavors, but they're still considered flavored products. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, think about the English blends. They're not allowed to put any toppings on their, on their pipe tobacco. So I, yeah, I, I don't know. But I mean, if you look at like components like BCA or 1Q that have topping on them, you're, you're, you're actually, those are long grandfathered. So 
I don't see why they can't be sold still. I think there's a battle there, no matter what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, excellent. Well, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank and you, guys. Good to see you guys. I, you know, it's I'm used to seeing you too, man. every now and then as he rolls through town. Uh, but I haven't seen anyone in so long. So it's good to see people. Yeah, great. And the last guys. time we saw each other was at TAA, and you got, I think you were in and out real quick. But, My parents, uh, I wasn't there. I saw you at the show last year. Oh, yeah. Case and I did a dinner last year at some point, too. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. I got to get, I mean, when this all travel ban gets back to normal, I'll, I'll make a point to get out there. I, I miss seeing that shop. I might just call you guys. You trim <laughs> this part. I might just call you guys and place my orders at going through Perales because I got to figure out what I want to do with the TAA stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I might want to, yeah. you know, I might want to put in my order, but split ship it a little bit. So there you go. Yeah. yeah you can call Andy at the office and I, he, he knows who you are. <laughs> He'll adjust it. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. All right. Thank, All right. Thanks, Very good. Well, hey, thank you guys. Good. Thanks, I appreciate guys. the time that you guys All right. Have. We yeah, appreciate you your time too. Thanks for being a, a great retailer of ours and thanks for the, uh, the long history. Always. Thanks. Appreciate it.